I just want to make sure my phone is off forever because I only want you in my head. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just going to clip that out. And <laughs> yeah, that's going to be that'll, the That'll be the whole thing. <laughs> I only want you in my head. As a broadcast journalist, I've spent my life traveling the world and made my living interviewing the greatest fighters of all time. When boxing shut down, I finally had a chance to look around this world of conflict and could see the fight in everyone. Until this day, I talk to the greatest fighters and thinkers of our time about their fight. On Luminary, I'm Radio Raheem. Till this day. May 29th, 2021. I sat down with Bob Saget. He drew me into a conversation when I had every intention of performing an interview. He had that way about him. He could throw everything you intended to do out the window simply by reminding you to stay in the moment. So out of respect for our friend Bob, that's what we're going to do. We're going to stay in the moment. Because if we're here with him, then he's still here with us. Chapter one, right here, right now. I'm proud of myself because I'm onto a new thing at, at 65. I'm different than I was. Yeah, we're all rethinking what we said 20 years ago, 10 years ago, four years ago. I'm not even rethinking it. I just don't have the same way of doing humor or conversation. I guess therapy, having three kids, watching people pass away in the past few years, mortality, all that stuff has fortunately changed me to, my kids tell me, Dad, you're, you're different. It's so nice to watch you grow. At 65, it's such a milestone. I hear more frequently than people having these epiphanies and understandings of life at 50. People are getting afraid at 50, and at 65, they're settling in and actually harnessing the wisdom. I know a lot of people, and I know you do, that get afraid at 30. And I was loving getting into 30 because I, I didn't want to live in my 20s. I was so depressed. I was just working at the comedy store always but I was hanging out with all geniuses who liked me. And I, I know it because I was in a Richard Pryor movie. Rodney Dangerfield put me in his first Young Comedian special. And all this shit happened, but I was really sad and on the road and went, why am I not on a sitcom? Why can't I get a movie career? And then I did a movie with Richard. And then that kind of gives you confidence, but then you get the uneducated view of life and think I'm never going to work again, you know, as soon as you do a gig. And then I knew some people like Kevin Costner, who was, we did the Groundlings together. And that's a workshop we paid to take. And he was cut out of the movie, The Big Chill. He was in the coffin. They just show like his hand. And he was the friend. He was in all these flashbacks with all the stars of that very famous movie. And I said, weren't you depressed? He said, no, because I knew I was with the right people. Being with the right people might be one of the most important aspects of life. The right people at the right time. And it has to be the right time because I've been with what people would think is the right people and I didn't belong there. I was fairly close with Tom Hanks for many years. I used to do the warm up on Bosom Buddies audience warm up. <laughs> no way. True. And so I was invited years later to Tom's birthday party and he'd already, you know, won the Academy God bless Award. You all. And Thank so you. I'm at his house for a party and I ended up in a circle with Steven Spielberg, Bruce Springsteen, Tom Cruise, and Patty, Bruce's wife, and Tom. And then we had shots of tequila, and Michael Keaton ran over to me and said, how the fuck are you standing in this group? And I said, you know, I don't know, but I can't leave. So Tom's talking about his private jet, and I didn't have a private jet, and Tom flies a private jet. And that's about being with what you would think is the right people, but it ain't the right time. And oftentimes, there'll be those gatekeepers that are like, what the fuck are you doing here? Which I was fine because I'd already been on TV. I'd had, my shows were in the top 10, you know, but I'm here with, but that's the high school of show business. And that's the, you know, you think you're accomplished if you know famous people. I was 20, you know, 21. So... I didn't know them. 
and now I stay away from people. I don't, I'm not a star fucker. I drop names a lot. I do that bad. <laughs> I mean, I just did it. And I'm doubling down by dropping names of people that probably didn't want me in their circle. So that's even <laughs> more uh, self-deprecating. But that is the high school society of Hollywood. And I realize it's not your resume that puts you in the group or makes you a part of these social groups that you're in. That shit is a product of who these people are at their core. It's not connections. It's who you are. People always go, it's who you know. No, it's not. It's who you are. And are you connected with them like you would be with anyone else? The kind of relationships that you have that allow you to put these benefits on and all that would make someone think, this guy must be third generation Hollywood. He must have grown up in a Hollywood family and Nothing. have all these connections. My dad was a meat executive with a supermarket company. We didn't have any money. I lived at home during college at Temple University, went to film school. And what, what what area did you grow up in? I was born in Philly. At four, I moved to Norfolk, Virginia. It was all because of my dad's supermarket chain was moving him around. And then I went to Encino, California, <laughs> just to learn materialism when I was 14. I stayed there till 17. It was real hard. I didn't have any friends. It would, okay, so forgive me for not doing the math myself, but the year, we're in the fifth. Seven, 71 to 74. No, what year are you born? A 56. 56. So That's when Columbus came over. <laughs> yeah, but yes, the history we're not sure about. And discovered the Saggots. He decided that they they all came to slaughter the American native. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I like that that's a punchline. <laughs> we have to, we have, yeah, that's what we go. I, yeah. I just go dark, and then people don't expect it because I look like an accountant. The world was so different then. And the reason I say people would think that you grew up in a Hollywood household is because you're so easy with it. I didn't know you personally in all these decades, but- like most, I knew of you, and you never were a rigid guy or never had any kind of issue racially. I, had, or I understand the issues, and they upset the hell out of me of what our world has always gone through and what humanity's always gone through, but I was not raised to see anything but people. I just know if someone's not nice to me, that's different. And in Norfolk, Virginia, kids would throw rocks at my head and call me a Jew, and they were just angry white kids. How did your parents see it? They threw rocks at my head also. <laughs> but that was to better you. It bettered me and let me be a, 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 you know, a self-deprecating Jew. But um, <laughs> my dad was very, I talked about it last night on stage here. My dad was very hurt by the situation of the world because there were segregated bathrooms and I was like six and seven. And it started to change as I got around nine or 10. The United States seemed to open up a little and I don't know, I didn't track the year, but I know it was after Kennedy was shot because I came home from school and they sent us home and my mom was ironing and crying and we're watching Walter Cronkite. And like you're saying, the world was different. It was three networks. Right. No Fox, there was three. How did you become aware of the world outside of your home and how that affected what was happening inside the home? I think it. I was just different and I always saw things that way. So I was drawn to anything that took me out of the world. I would look at a lot of movies. All I did was watch movies. So when movies, any science fictions came out, I was right there. I was in the theater in my teens when Planet of the Apes came out with Charlton Heston, and I went, That's what we're going to do to the planet. That We have to be very careful we don't drop the bomb. Because at the end, he's, spoiler alert, Planet of the Apes, the original, they show the Statue of Liberty, and he goes, God damn it, you went and did it. And he said, God damn it, at the end of this movie, which is not something I say in my stand-up, you know. I would rather just use the normal ones that we're used to. <laughs> because of the religious... No, it just I just didn't feel... That's why I feel fortunate if people have said things they try to cancel, you know, the Gen Z says they saw me on the Comedy Central Rose from years back, and people were saying things about me, and because I laughed, they said that I'm guilty of what they said about me. Uh, Which is insane, because right. the things that I said were wicked. First thing, I would never say them today. If I said them today, I would definitely apologize, because that would be a huge mistake. So you, f I feel people where it is. Turn on the news, I know what I'm not comfortable saying. I don't have to learn what words trigger people and what words hurt people. I know what they are. Well, you learned what how society hurts people when you were discussing 
segregated bathrooms. Did you see that kind of discrimination as a Jewish kid, or were you looking at uh, that? As a, as a person, as a young person. I never thought of myself as a Jewish kid. I did it because I was supposed to get bar mitzvah because that's what you're supposed to do. And as I've gotten older, and I've gone to Israel, and I went with my ex-wife and her parents, and I went on a tour mostly. I, I went to the Dome of the Rock, which terribly unfortunate things happened this year there. The Old Testament says it's where Abraham was going to slay Isaac. Muhammad supposedly ascended to heaven from there. There's major things on this one place. And it's also, most importantly, in showbiz terms, it's where the Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden from the Nazis in this spot. When I went years ago, people were allowed to go in. There were people on the walls with machine guns, Palestinians, and then there were Israeli soldiers, but it was relatively peaceful because it's the Middle East, for God's sakes. And what's happening now is heartbreaking on every level because... I try to see things from every side that exists. And that, you know, nonpartisan is just a foolish word. That's not it needs to be said, but it's, for me, it's just about caring about all human beings. Your parents were both professionals. Were they- my mom was a prostitute and my dad was in the meat business. Yeah, well, that's the oldest profession, Bob. It is. And the meat business kind of goes along <laughs> with it metaphorically. <laughs> Depending on how you beat it. You can't beat my dad's meat. You can beat his prices. <laughs> but he was funny, too. He was very funny. But in reality, obviously, your mother uh, wasn't. No, my mother was not a prostitute. <laughs> not, she was the opposite. She was very puritanical, told me not to use bad language. And guess what that does to a kid who's already got that little wink in his eye of saying stuff against the grain? Just to, I don't know, just to wake people up, to have fun. Not to be a dirty little bastard, but just to have fun. And I was nine. and my, We had so many deaths growing up that my dad would just instill that in me. He didn't teach it to me. I just saw how he reacted. I mean, he lost, he buried four brothers and a sister in his life. He buried all his siblings. I helped him write the speech at 3.30 in the morning in Philly. And because of where I was in the world, I could just fly them in and out. I said, it's going to be the shortest funeral of your life, Dad. You're 85, and I'm not putting you through this anymore. And his brother passed away, and he lived to about 78, which was longer than any of the others. They died at like 40, 37, really weird heart attacks. So I have a heart doctor as my GP. And my dad wrote a speech. We did it together. He never drinks. He had a martini with me. He's gone. But you talk present day on people when they're gone and they were so close. And he gave the best speech. I gave him the, and he wrote, he wrote it. But I just kind of moved things around like you do for people, especially when they're grieving. And it just, his ending was something like, I'll see you in 30 years, Joe. You know, and that's, that's it's good to close with something sweet that makes people feel the love. When you started losing aunts and uncles, how old were you? I guess it started when I was like seven. And then every two years, somebody died. And I, I had a cousin die. She died at 23 of cancer after giving birth to her child. And then a lot of cousins went through a lot of hardship. So I was like nine, 10, 11, 12, 14. It was a lot. And then I lost both my sisters. So... It's difficult for anybody to deal with grief. At a seven years old, you lose a pet and you think the world is over. Yeah. And so when your parents are dealing with something that heavy, no matter how old you are as a kid, you recognize that they might need something from you. You talked about helping your dad write obituary or the speech. What was it like for you watching them go through that? And then how did you digest it yourself? How did you feel your role was in this whole thing? Well, to be honest with you, at nine years old, I picked up an eight millimeter camera and I just made projects. I shot all these terrible eight millimeter movies and put friends in them that I could find. I made friends by putting them in movies. So if I didn't have friends or a play date, I would just shoot movies every weekend when I wasn't doing school or mowing the lawn or whatever my chores were. I was a good kid, except for shoplifting, you know, the usual stuff. Uh, those science fiction movies you were watching and movies I suppose you were shooting yourself, 
He talked about just wanting to escape, just wanting to right. get out. And that's what movies do for us. What was it that you were trying to escape? Well, there's a, so much pain. And my parents couldn't deal with it. And every time they finally started to try to regroup, something else terrible happened. And then one of my sisters got this disease, scleroderma, in 1994. I was not really successful yet. It was like a year or two later that it started to happen for me. And then I made a TV movie about it in 96. So I think I was on, yeah, I was working with ABC. So they let me make this TV movie with Dana Delaney starring in it, kind of playing my sister called for hope. And scleroderma is this weird disease. So I've done over 30 years of benefits and we've raised over $50 million for the scleroderma research foundation. It affects mostly women and they, you can die from your lungs, pulmonary hypertension. This is an autoimmune and vascular disease, but it's more prevalent than you would think. So uh, it's my, one of my life's work because my sister died at 47, that one. Oh. That's the best part about being an only child, man. You don't have to worry about losing a sibling. Yeah, but you have a different relationship with loss altogether. And what losses did you have? Well, they all, the reason, you know, they all happened before I was able to understand what life was about, right? Like, uh, I was a single mom, not because she was divorced, but my father was murdered. But before I was I didn't able to know that, you know, I was two. So there's no concept of that, right? You just grow up in this situation. But everybody else seems to have a very different situation. Yeah. And I didn't lose any siblings, but I also didn't have any. So it's not a sense of loss so much as a sense of never having had the experience in the first place. I don't know which is worse or better, but they both leave a hole. It's you know? a vacuous hole because your dad, I mean, you don't have memory really at two. You got photos. Right. And then and everybody else knew him. But you didn't, and they all want to tell you about him, and somehow you form this imagination in your mind. And so they fill you with love about him. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> but also the <laughs> but, complexity. But also their perception, and you don't get to counter that with your own. Which no, is, uh, frustrating. You have to put it all together, like you're collecting evidence, right? And then make it work for you. Like you're not going to put together something you don't want to have to live with. So who knows how accurate my perception is of what the man did or who he was, but I had to just fit the molding that I could accept. And so... Hey, what are the circumstances? And I'm not going to ask you here. I know you've talked about it on here, I'm sure. Yeah, No, no, I haven't. You haven't? No, no. Because the show's not about me But so I look much. at it as a discourse, though, no matter what. People who have accomplished great things and are consistently reaching to do something else are fighting against a finality that like you say oh well this could be my last job every job could be my last well, job. well i don't have I, I i got rid of that i i do not possess that but you had it oh god forever you know for decades but after going through ten thousand rejections you kind of get it it's like next i don't even let a rejection mean a thing everything i've had was an accident it would be an incoming phone call to a manager who would call me and say, okay, they, they want you to replace a guy on Full House. They always wanted you. I got fired from a morning show, so I became available. So they reshot stuff to put me in it. And everything, Richard Pryor movie was just on an open audition. And the director, Michael Apt, had hired me. And then Richard and I knew each other from the comedy store. So they started writing more scenes for me because we hit it off and we were having fun. And everything in my career, Hosting Saturday Night Live is one of the more fun things you can do. It just it just happens. You can try, but it's incoming is how things happen because the world perceives you a certain way. All these things happen because you're available to do them and you are in people's consciousness. And but your, that... ener your energy comes out. And it is the popularity contest that is show business that you don't really think about because it's just because your star rose at that time. <laughs> <laughs> 